Um, I'm going to sh share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks, Ian, for that uh, for the introduction. And um, you already said sort of who I am, so I don't need to go uh, into that. But um, I do want to follow up and say thank you to Ian and to Megan uh, and to the LMEC um, for inviting me to talk about uh, this new data set. And I want to thank all the participants for for coming and, and hearing about this and um, doing some of the mapping at, at the end of this this session. So. Um, I'm going to talk here uh, about uh, the data set that I've cleaned from the uh, Homeowners Loan Corporation residential security map shown here in the background. Um, but I'm going to start off with um, just a little bit of background about the agency itself to give a little bit of, uh, of context. So the Homeowners Loan Corporation was um, signed into law in 1933, the first year of FDR's um, President, first presidential administration. And uh, the purpose of the agency was uh, initially to issue refinancing loans to struggling homeowners who were facing foreclosure. Um, the, the idea was that uh, through federal government assistance and insurance, uh, the HOLC could reduce the monthly payment that uh, struggling homeowners had to pay off to the lenders, um, which would in turn allow more people to stay in their homes uh, rather than going into foreclosure and would allow uh, the private lenders uh, who owned those mortgages um, to recoup a, a larger share, albeit over a longer time period, um, of those, of those uh, uh, mortgages. Um, that program, however, was only uh, administered for three years. And then after that, for the bulk of the life of the HOLC, um, it essentially became a property managing and selling firm. So shortly after the refinancing program was initiated, even though monthly payments were reduced, a lot of people facing wage cuts and unemployment still could not make those payments and then would go into foreclosure and that property would then become owned by the HOLC. And uh, so after that, those short years of refinancing, the HLC was basically tr just trying to repair these properties, um, rent them out, and then it had a mandate to try to sell them as quickly as possible. Um, actually, by I think by 1940 or so, the HLC actually was the largest urban residential property owner in the entire United States. I think at their peak, they owned close, almost, to, almost a quarter million, um, a little less than a quarter million houses across the United States. Um, but the reason that most people talk about the HLC today is something called the City Survey Program, uh, which was initiated in 1935, right around the transition period uh, from when the HLC went from refinancing to property selling agency. And the City Survey Program, um, the idea was to send out a bunch of uh, neighborhood appraisers, many of whom were regularly employed in uh, real estate uh, or in lending themselves. Uh, they were sent out into the field across uh, hundreds of cities in the United States, and they collected a mass amount of data uh, in these uh, a massive amount of data in these places, and um, built up these maps where they rated neighborhoods essentially on the risk they posed to property investors. So here's here's the the redlining map, the so-called uh, HLC redlining map for Boston, to get you an idea uh, of what these maps look like if you haven't seen them already. Um, and the, the field agents sent out by the HOLC, uh, they did a four grade schema going from A, which were considered the best neighborhoods with the lowest risk, down to D, which were colored red, uh, and those were considered the riskiest. Um, to make these maps, they took a lot of things into account. Um, for example, the housing age and condition of these neighborhoods, uh, the proximity uh, of factories and other noxious land uses, and importantly, the racial composition of these places. Uh, particularly the black population percentage and the percentage of immigrant residents. Um, and an important note uh, about these maps, they're, they're often called redlining maps, um, but the HLC did not actually use these maps for redlining. Um, by the time that they drew these maps up from between 1937 and 1940, they had completely stopped their refinancing program. Uh, and a lot of analyses have actually looked into that refinancing program and found that the HOLC issued a bulk of their loans actually in 
the lowest grades in C and D um, graded neighborhoods. Um, and it, which kind of makes sense because those are the neighborhoods that were more likely were likely to have a, a larger share of homeowners um, facing foreclosure. But these are often called redlining maps because um, they can provide some important details into how lenders and other property investors of the time understood uh, neighborhood level risk. So the um, a lot of this data um, has been made publicly available um, on this really nice user-friendly interface uh, from the Digital Scholarship Lab at the University of Richmond. Um, I believe there's probably links later on onto this website. It's really useful um, to, zo uh, to zoom into these places um, and you can click on these neighborhoods and you can actually see the notes that the uh, appraisers made in these places to get an idea of uh, what they considered were, for example, favorable influences, detrimental influences, um, information on the trend of desirability, occupation of workers, um, incomes, the foreign born population, the black population, um, the number of families that were on government relief, and then all sorts of information on housing from uh, the, the type of housing to the type of construction, the repair status, the age of housing, and all sorts of information all the way down to this little area where uh, the neighborhood appraisers actually just wrote um, whatever notes you know they, they considered were important for future um, uh, uh, people who would be looking at these notes. And these were used, um, it's believed, to um, devise this, this A to D rating schema. So there's lots of uh, important and interesting information in these notes. Um, and also, uh, the um, the DSL website, they have a really nice little way. You can just simply download these um, and you can, they've already done all the digitalization. So you can actually get all of those notes and those map grades um, as shape files. And then with all of that information um, already processed through an OCR process. And um, it's easy, you know, you can do a control F through that information to sort of sort through it. Um, however, if you import that data, this is what it looks like. This is just one cell uh, from an Excel, or if it was in an Excel file, this would be one cell. Um, with all of that information for each neighborhood, there's about six to 7,000 neighborhoods that they have this information for. And this is just one of those neighborhoods. And this is what all that data from that area description sheet looks like. So it's not super useful in, it, in its current format. Um, so the aim uh, that I was trying to do with this project was to take this information and to put it in a more usable uh, tabular format that would allow analysis of those variables in those area description sheets. So I did that. I'm going to walk just kind of briefly through some of the steps I took to get that data um, in that more usable format. So the first step was uh, essentially to tabulate that data, to take it from that single cell uh, in Excel and then put it across multiple cells with header names that you can kind of make sense of. Um, and the way, I won't go into too much detail, but essentially the idea is to, you can look at these and you can identify these patterns where you have numbers here followed by a colon. So you've got a five here, 2B, 3G, 3Q. Um, these are all different uh, uh, sections that are on the sheet. And so these all are correspond with a different variable on that sheet. So what I did was I identified those variables, what each of these sheets, what each of these um, uh, indicators meant, and then you can give them a, a name that makes more sense, and then you can put it out into column format. So you have, for example, the terrain, the favorable and detrimental influences, uh, the inhabitant type, family income, foreign born, black population, infiltration notes, all of that information in a much more um, easily navigable uh, spreadsheet. However, the issue here is that while this is much more easily readable, uh, you still got all these characters and, and numbers and symbols all sort of still in these in these columns. So you can't do any systematic analysis with any of this quite yet. You could read through it much easier and much quicker, um, but you can't sort of make graphs or charts or run regressions or anything like that. Um, so the next step was to take some of the numerical variables. Um, for example, the, the four that I, I um, paid most attention to were the, the foreign born black population percentages and then the building age and family incomes. I, I took them 
from um, this format, which is what you just saw with sort of these alphanumeric um, characters and symbols, and then extracted out the numbers and, and put it into a format where you just have the numbers. So now all of a sudden, you can take that information and do some analysis to it. Um, for example, just taking that information for, um, I, I took that information for 129 cities uh, across the country and then broke down those variables by uh, HOLC neighborhood grade and by region. And so you can get just a quick snapshot here um, looking at each of these variables. For example, um, the black percentage, uh, you could see here across regions, almost all of those uh, neighborhoods with any black population uh, were assigned D grades. That's what's, that's what's going on here. A very few number were assigned uh, C grades, um, but most uh, were, were given a, a, the, lowest, the lowest grade, were given the red grade. Um, then you can look into the foreign born population. Similarly, you've got a similar pattern, but a higher proportion of neighborhoods with foreign born residents um, were given either C grade or B grade. Um, I think it's it's kind of interesting to note some of the disparity between regions. For example, in the West, there's a much larger gap between the C and the D neighborhood than in other areas, um, which probably has to do with um, a harsher grade given to um, Mexican American, Chinese, Filipino neighborhoods, which are more commonly located in the West. Whereas in the Midwest and Northeast, a lot of the immigrant populations were from Europe, and those those neighborhoods often got uh, were more likely to get a C grade um, than in the West. Um, then you can look at income, where, as you'd expect, sort of higher incomes in the green neighborhoods, and then, and then it slopes downwards. And then building age is the opposite, where older buildings uh, are most often located in neighborhoods that received lower uh, HOLC grades. So that's just sort of a, a snapshot of, of, of this data um, once it's been tabulated. Um, also, I wanted to look at some of the descriptive variables. So I, I focused on four. Um, I focused on the repair status, the mortgage availability, the occupational class, and the foreign-born group. And so these uh, descriptors in that in that Excel uh, sheet, they look. I mean, you've got all sorts of different words used to describe the condition of housing, mortgage availability, and occupation class. And then the task for me was then to sort of condense those down into like five recognizable categories. Like for example, for repair, I was able to break it down into good, fair, good, fair, fair, poor, and poor, uh, and so on for mortgage availability and occupation class. So you can um, produce visualizations like this, for example, um, where you can get sort of the breakdown by HOLC grade of, of each of these uh, five um, categories associated with each variable. Uh, so for home repair status, as you'd expect in A neighborhoods, these are mostly considered good, according to the sheets. Uh, you've got a little more variability in B neighborhoods and C neighborhoods, and then you get down to D neighborhoods, and um, you have a much higher proportion. Uh, the the um, appraiser wrote down, a, uh, said that the repair status was poor in those neighborhoods. Um, you've got similar patterns with mortgage availability, more available in A neighborhoods, and then it goes down to the least available in uh, D neighborhoods, and then um, you can go to occupational class and see sort of the similar, a similar sort of pattern. Uh, and then the final thing I'll talk about here before we go into the exercise will be another thing you can do with the data, um, which is look at the, uh, the uh, quote unquote foreign born population group that's listed in the sheets. And then you can break down uh, the, the HOLC grade by, um, by the listing of different groups. Um, so, for example, on the far left here, you can see East Asian and Pacific Islander groups were the most likely to be uh, assigned. The neighborhoods with those populations listed in the sheets were most likely to be assigned a red grade compared to the other populations, followed by the black. Uh, if, if, if there was any black population mentioned, um, followed by often it would, uh, the, the records often say Latin population, which in the West is most often specified as Mexican, Mexican-American. Um, and then in other parts of the country, um, there's Puerto Rican and Cuban residents and sometimes Central American. Those come um, next. Um, and then you get to sort of Southern um, European, Eastern European, down to Irish, Jewish, Nordic, and sort of your Central, Western, Northern European over here. Um, 
Okay. So that's, that's, uh, that's sort of a breakdown of what the data set is like. Um, I can con transition now into, uh, here, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Um, I can transition now into the, uh, um, into the activity. Um, that sounds great. And Scott, if, if I can, yeah, can I just chime in for a, a minute to, um, I'm going to go ahead and drop into the, the chat here <clears throat> a link uh, to our data portal um, <clears throat> that where you can access and download the data that Scott just described. Um, you may want to do it now and, you know, I, it might be kind of hard to follow along with the demo that he's about to give, but I just wanted everyone to have that link so, uh, so that you can access it, um, you know. Uh, keep it in your in your notes um, but yeah back over to you Scott okay well um, I'm gonna so I'm gonna walk through the demo now and I'm gonna walk through downloading the data um, and then importing it into QGIS and then just sort of quickly bringing up um, the map so I will go ahead and share my screen again let's see Oops. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to walk through, uh, where to get the, uh, where to get the data. Um, I just, you can follow that link, but I just, I just type in LMEC data, um, and it comes up right here. And then you can scroll down to housing. And it's right here, tabulated HLC area description sheet data. And then you can just hit download to your computer. And while that downloads, I'm gonna go ahead and open up QGIS to get that up and running. Okay. I'll open, I'll open, sorry, I got, I got multiple monitors going on. So um, I, I like to save it, um, you know, if you have a folder, I've called mine 2022 LMEC. That's kind of where I'm just going to keep all of this data. So if you want to um, bring the GeoJSON file into there, just so you can find it a little easier. Okay. And then I'll start on QGIS once that opens. I'll, I'll uh, start a new. I'll start a new project here. I like to start off. So I, I usually use ArcGIS Pro. So this is I'm a little unfamiliar over here. Um, but I usually like to start off uh, with, let's see, with setting up the, um, uh, the coordinate system. So it's, uh, you can just type it in. I don't know if this is the one y'all use in Massachusetts normally, but that's the one I'm, I'm gonna go with. Um, oh, I've got it saved up here, but you can go to um, the Massachusetts mainland. That's, that's the one I like um, for this projection. Set that up. Um, I also like to put in some um, uh, imagery to help sort of guide me. So let's see, we'll need to go to uh, the plugins, manage and install plugins. Are we good on pacing? Okay. Sorry, yeah, we're, we're in good shape here. Um, so, okay. yeah. Okay, so, um, so we're putting in plug. Uh, I'm putting in a plugin just to get some satellite imagery to help sort of guide us. Um, you can type in Quick Map Services real quick and just install that plugin. Doesn't take too long. Okay. All right, and then you can go to Web up here, and then it, it should pop up there. Um, you probably don't have all of these options yet, but you can add. I believe you can add those options. Um, by going to the settings. And then I think you can add, you can get get contributed pack. Um, I already had it, so it didn't do much. And then you can you can look at the visibility and it, it'll provide sort of the different types of uh, imagery that you can you can add to your map. Um, you can worry, you can set that up as you like. And then you can go back to web to quick map services. I like the Google hybrid, um, but you can set up anyone sort of you you feel familiar with um, NASA or, or uh, OpenStreetMap or something like that. And then zoom, I zoom into Boston here. Um, and then 
we'll go to layer up top. We're going to import that layer that I just downloaded. So you can go to layer up top and then hit add layer down here. And then we're going to add vector layer. And you should see this, this box pop up here. We can click this to open up our, our files. I've already got it linked here, but you can navigate to your to the little folder you set up where you've got your files. Um, you can just double click that and then hit add down here. Takes just a moment, but then it comes in. You've got the you've got the file. And this is actually for the 129 cities that we've got data for. But since we're just looking at Boston, we'll go ahead and set a query to remove all those other, other places. So, oh, sorry, let's see. We'll do right click on the layer over here and you'll go down to properties, click that. And then here on source, you can go down to query builder right down here, click that. Um, I'm gonna, I'm going to query out all of the cities except Boston. So I'm going to look at the metro layer or the metro uh, areas. Double click that. And then over here, we can, we can hit all to get a list of all the cities that are available. And I'm going to navigate here to Boston. I've got it labeled as Greater Boston because there are actually a few cities um, within the Boston area that are, that are graded. Whoops, I forgot to put an equal sign here. Hit OK. We've got Metro equals Greater Boston. OK. And then that should take out all these other cities. That way we're just we're just dealing with the Boston neighborhoods. OK, how are we doing? I think we're good. I, I don't I don't mind uh, running a little long on the demo because I actually think that this is really useful for people to see before we dive into like any activities. So take your okay. time. I, I think that we're doing good. Well, I also just want to make sure I'm not going too quick. Someone might have. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. If I mean, if anyone has uh, questions from the crowd about kind of what we're looking at throughout, um, feel free to to chime in. Okay, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna move ahead, and we're gonna just go ahead and add some symbology so we can get these grades looking kind of like how they look on the on the uh, the, the website. Um, and on those old maps. So again, we'll right click the layer. We'll scroll down to properties, hit properties. We'll go to symbology on the left, symbology here. Now up top, you'll see this drop down menu. Let's go to uh, categorized. So we've got categorized data. And then from this drop down, we can look for HOLC grade. So that's going to be the A to D grade. So we'll click that. And we'll hit classify down here and those will pop up. That's the colors that, that pop up. Um, we don't need these others. There's a few cities that have um, not, they don't have the, they have uh, it's either through mistakes or some cities actually put included an E grade. Um, so that's what, what's going on here. We can leave those out. Um, and then we'll just double click on the color here and then we'll just get something close to the green. It doesn't have to be exact, but we'll, uh, we'll find something pretty close to what the maps look like. And we'll do that for each for each layer. Blue, um, B is already blue, so I'm just, for me, um, I'm just gonna leave it there. C, I'll move that to a, to a yellow. And then D, we'll double click that and move that to, to a red. Yeah, those are uh, probably close enough. Um, down here, you can go to layer rendering. I like to make it a little transparent um, just so you can kind of see the, the satellite imagery, what's there in the background. So you can reduce that down to around 60% or wherever you'd like and then hit OK. And then there you go. This is uh, more or less sort of the, the kind of matching the colors. You kind of you kind of get the, the idea here. So that's just sort of mapping the, the, basic, um, the basic layer that you import. But now I'm, I'm interested in looking at uh, some of the other variables that I've cleaned up in here and seeing how these might overlay uh, these traditional boundaries. So we're gonna go back over to the layer and we'll right click it 
And then we'll go down to duplicate layer. Okay, so we've got an, a, a duplicate layer. Um, I'll just leave that one there. And then we'll go back up to, to, to this layer, right click it and hit properties. And then we're gonna, we're gonna map one of these other variables. So for this demonstration, I'm just gonna look at um, the, the age of the property since uh, property age was a, a big one for, for how these grades were, were assigned. So that's, a, that's a, a numerical category. So we'll go to the graduated symbology up here. Um, and then for the variable, uh, these, these have some, some code names that you kind of got to decipher. And, but you've got, let's see, mid age. So that's, that's the building age midpoint. So that's the variable for the housing age. Um, and then we'll we've got that there. We'll classify that. And we've got these, these categories here. I'll just leave it as quantile. So these are basically broken up into fifths on how old the housing is. I'm going to change this color though, because uh, I don't want it to sort of interact too much with the, uh, the redlined grade. Oh, whoops. Let's see. We're going to, we're going to mess with color two. We're going to go to color two and I'm going to do like a purple. Okay. And then so we can map that. And actually, I'm going to go back in there and uh, I'm going to, I'm going to make it fully opaque. So then you've got sort of a, uh, you got, you can group it by age and then like real quick, you can kind of see as you'd expect sort of the, a lot of the older areas are closer to the city. Um, something I think is kind of interesting to do with this data is then to toggle it on and off with some of the grades to kind of get, get an idea. And when you do that, you can sort of, you can sort of pick out little uh, um, aberrations. So like I've noticed this, this one here, it's kind of interesting because this has like kind of a low, this is not that old of a neighborhood here. We'll, uh, hold on, I've got to, we'll hit the identifier button and then we'll, we'll hit this grade. And you, you've got the variables popping up over here, the mid age, 20 years, it's not that old for Boston. And yet this is a redlined area. So that's sort of interesting. Um, and then, so we could perhaps dig into this, to this area. You've got the variables over here. Um, you can see here, it's a 90% uh, foreign born population, which is predominantly Italian according to the sheets. So that's sort of an interesting case of an area that doesn't have that old of housing units. Um, and in fact, also has mortgage availability and yet still receives a red grade uh, possibly, I mean, one contributing factor certainly is that the high number of, of immigrants that live in that neighborhood is, is possibly a contributing factor. So one, one thing I like to do with this data is just sort of overlay it with these layers and just sort of kind of, you can just kind of spot the aberrations. Can I chime in here for a second, Scott? Um, yeah. Just it with the... Uh, it, this is a really interesting case where some of the data that Scott is walking us through might overlap um, uh, sort of productively and raise uh, interesting questions with another tool we have at the center called Atlascope, which many of you may have come across before, but I'm just going to drop a link into the chat um, of, of that neighborhood with a Bromley Atlas from 1930 that you can scale and slide to kind of compare um, you know, what might be going on there, look at some of the houses, look at some of the other institutions and buildings, um, and, and continue to kind of put together a, a, this rich picture of what the area was like and uh, where these grades are coming from. Again, not something you need to look at now, but um, just another way that you can kind of use th this data um, to, to come up with interesting questions. That's a great point too, Ian. Like I, I don't know much about Boston, but um, for for people at the center or who are, live in the neighborhood or who know it, a lot of these different categories and locations have a lot more meaning um, to you than than they would to me. And so it's interesting to kind of look at cities that you're really familiar with, um, and then you can kind of get an idea of sort of how how these you know some of the sort of aberrations and some of the internal variability. 
that's happening in a lot of these places and kind of if you have good resources at, at sort of at the library in that area or other archives, you can really sort of dig into, you know, what's going on in these sorts of places where you've got this sort of deviation from what you would expect based on the grades alone and then the final grade or on the on the uh, variables alone and then the final grade. Um, the last one I'll look at, I'll look at another one I saw, I think I noticed over here. Um, again, I don't know much about Boston, but sort of, I know this, uh, You've got the Boston Common here, and you've got this this strip here. This area, whoops, this area here uh, has very old housing. Actually, fifty mid the midpoint housing age is fifty years old, which means a lot of them means a lot of them were older than this actually. And yet, and yet this is a, this is a blue neighborhood. Oh, it's, so this is like the second highest category. So it's kind of interesting to see like how you know certain maybe an old neighborhood uh, in the abstract you would think that would be more likely to be graded lower but once you combine it with some of the other variables and sort of the local knowledge um, and then really what like the lenders and real estate people who are creating these maps want to use these maps for and, and thinking about these places how there's these sorts of deviations from from expectations so that's yeah that's sort of a breakdown of just of the data you can bring in and, and sort of play around with. Um, I'll kick it back to Ian, um, who can talk about some of the activity. Yeah, sounds great. Um, and I, I just also, can you actually throw your screen back up there for, <laughs> for a second? Just because that that was a really, um, that was a great pull. Uh, that, that neighborhood in particular um, is right around when this was surveyed in the you know, 1930, this is right before Boston University is being constructed. So if you went back and looked at maps of this area at the time, you would see uh, property transitions. I mean, you could do this on Atlas scope and kind of click from 1910 to 20 to 30. Um, and you would see that the property is being sold off to the trustees of Boston University. Um, one of the key points of the HOLC grades was that they were looking into the future and trying to assess um, this temporal element as well as the, sp the spatial qualities of, of these places. So, um, and that's something that Scott has done a, a great job of kind of highlighting for me in, in past conversations. So yeah, just wanted to make mention of that um, right along the Esplanade at, at Storrow Drive that um, it makes a lot of sense that this would be rated B actually based on some of the economic processes that were happening at the time. I, I would also <laughs> add that um, I like, you know, you can bring up the 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 DSL website with these um, because I haven't I haven't provided the notes in in this file. I've got them. Um, you can actually get those from some of the data you can access through the LMAC website, but it's really helpful also to look at like where they allow the the appraiser to just kind of freehand and just write what they want about it. So it's interesting to sort of match these up where you can spot them real quickly. On, on, you know, through QGIS. And then you can actually go, once you identify sort of an interesting case, you can go back to the DSL website, go to that neighborhood and see what they've written. Um, just when they, when they don't have like, you know, a prompt, they're just saying what they want to say about it. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, well, so, so we're probably, we got about 30 minutes left here. Um, and, you know, we were, thinking maybe we would break this up into breakout groups, but um, I actually think that the number that we have right here is is going to be really manageable for just kind of staying together and, and working through this activity. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share a, uh, I'm going to share a Word document here with, uh, uh, in the Zoom chat um, <clears throat> that uh, will bring you to uh, a little, uh, couple page worksheet, um, not really a worksheet. It's more just a, a set of uh, instructions and questions that you might think about um, as you access this data. So uh, we asked as part of the workshop that you download QGIS in advance. Um, it's okay if you didn't get the chance to do that. Um, go ahead and spend a couple of minutes downloading it now. If you haven't, uh, the link is there right at the top of the document. And why don't I go ahead and share my screen and just as I, uh, <clears throat> as I talk through this, um, and I'll be, I'll be quick so that we can have as much time uh, as possible together. Um, everyone can see this okay, right? Great. Um, yeah, so um, I think that, I think for the sake of time, we can probably pass on 
introductions maybe until we get to the a group discussion later on. But what I'd love for us to do is so go ahead and download QGIS. Um, you can ignore all the stuff about breakout groups. Um, and uh, just what, what we're going to do is follow basically what Scott just did for us, right? Um, and do that on your own. Navigate to the LMEC website um, and the data portal. You can do that here at a link that we've we've plugged in for you. Um, and, and run back through that process that, that he just did. And if you run into uh, little roadblocks as you do so, we can give you a hand with that. Um, asking some questions about what kinds of patterns, anomalies, and surprises you find in the data. Um, if you have enough time, you can even pull down some other data sets um, and compare them to the redlining uh, or to the HOLC uh, data that Scott's put together. Um, we'll do that for about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and then we'll come back together and chat a little bit about what we uh, found here. I think this is really uh, the part of the workshop where you know you can uh, be independently make some uh, potentially interesting discoveries. And it doesn't have to be about Boston, right? If you wanted to pull down the data that Scott was just looking at for a city in Kentucky or a city in you know Nevada, you can do that. Um, it's all in there. So uh, go ahead and do so. Um, and Maybe let's say right around 4.30, we'll come back together and, uh, and chat a little bit about what, uh, what you found interesting.